Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Amata, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. We're going to kick off proceedings this lovely evening with some more news regarding the GTX 1660 Ti. So what we have this fine evening for this particular topic is a leak from the EEC, and according to this very leak, ASUS is planning quite a few models for the 1660 Ti, and... We have two different memory configurations listed by ASUS. We see a 6GB variant and a 3GB variant as well. But at least from what I can tell from their product listings, the 6GB variant is most likely going to be exclusive to the ROG Strix series of cards. Now you may recall the Galax 1660 tie that we saw, I believe it was either yesterday or the day before, genuinely the days are starting to blend in together a little bit now, uh, where it listed 6 gigabytes as the memory configuration on the box, but it does seem at least with ASUS yeah, there is two memory configurations available. I would not be surprised at all to see this with other AIBs as well, but of course for the moment all we have seen for this is with ASUS, but of course we are expecting these cards to be announced on the 22nd of this month, so it's not going to be that long at all, in fact it's just over a week until we actually get the announcement for this, so that's when we're going to know exactly what's going on, and of course we're going to know what's going on with the Founders Edition cards as well. So we're going to move on from that to a little something from TSMC. Now I've been talking a lot about TSMC in the last few months about just how well the company is doing. They have been on an absolute tear lately and it seems they are not slowing down anytime soon as following the completion of 7nm EUV they are already making a path clear towards 5nm and even towards 3nm as well. So basically over the next six weeks we are going to see TSMC ramp up its 7nm EUV production to full scale and then following that we're going to be seeing the 5nm process move to risk production status and then EUV is going to remain in use for 5nm and is expected to be viable down to 3nm. So basically what we're going to be seeing is TSMC taping out chip designs on 5nm nodes by the end of 2019 and then volume production is slated for early 2020. So basically we're going to be seeing much easier tape outs for TSMC for 5nm and 3nm. Of course 7nm process has been in large scale production since April April of last year. They have of course made the switch to EUV which allows for a few important things like fewer steps required during production and fewer defects and so on and so forth and of course they're going to be getting more business from high com performance computing and so on and so forth so of course they're going to be investing more into this particular area of the business and long story short we are expecting as I said to see volume production for 5nm by early 2020 so yeah they're, they're basically on fire right now they're not stopping of course 7nm has been pretty successful for them whether or not 5nm will be the same of course it's really really hard to say it might not be as, as good or well received as 7nm has been at least so far so we'll have to wait and see in this one but let's move on to something really interesting from some researchers at MIT now what they're actually looking to do is essentially change the material that our CPUs are based on and obviously as you may or may not know, flexing a semiconductor can actually improve its performance and researchers at MIT has already said, as well as some in Russia and Singapore, are making use of AI and of course machine learning to actually, well, figure out the best material. Because obviously when it comes to something like diamond, putting a bit of strain on it can obviously change the material properties, but obviously it's the right amount of strain that is the key though. So obviously that is where the AI comes in. So this, TI, this team of researchers, should I say, has basically figured out a way for machine learning to find the strains that will achieve the best results. So the algorithm predicts how much of a direction and degree of strain will affect a key property, which obviously would affect the efficiency of a semiconductor and is basically much, much more efficient than a human could be when it comes to obviously calculations and educated guesses and so on and so forth. So this could lead to some really interesting inventions based on semiconductors that are far more powerful than usual with only some minor changes. So in theory at least, if they sort, so if they've managed to figure out the, the right, the perfect sort of solution with diamond or similarly gallium nitrate or silicon carbide, they could theoretically operate at higher temperatures while utilizing more power and offering high frequency efficiency. 
Now, I do have a bit of a statement here from an MIT, MIT excuse me, nuclear science and engineering professor, Ju Lee, and she said, quote, when you get more than 7% strain, you really change a lot of the material. This new method could potentially lead to the design of unprecedented material properties, but much further work will be needed to figure out how to impose the strain and how to scale up the process to do it on 100 million transistors on a chip and ensure that none of them can fail. So essentially it is going to be a while before this ever sees the light of day, but it is still really, really cool and I find this sort of stuff fascinating as I've said before, this is one of the reasons why I love technology is stuff like this, it's like, yeah, it's going to be probably quite a few years before we see hide nor hear of this, but it could just be an interesting step forward that you might not expect like, to change the material it's based on could have such a really massive increase in efficiency and power and obviously the thickness as well so you could even have the same amount of power but just at a much much thinner density than we have at the moment so even that in itself would be an impressive achievement even ignoring all the other stuff as well that i've already mentioned like the efficiency and obviously and all that other so all that other stuff but it is obviously very very complicated as julie said that herself that you've got <laughs> millions of transistors and they need to make sure this is going to be you know operating across all of them for this to actually be successful so Keep your eyes peeled on this one, guys, but it's, it's going to be in the back burner for a while. Let's just put it that way, shall we? Now, the next topic on our itinerary rover is also regarding a technology that is fairly new, but it's actually out in the wild, and that is none other than the ray tracing. So, obviously, there has been a lot of talk about ray tracing ever since NVIDIA unveiled it at the RTX Touring official unveiling at Gamescom. There's been a lot of excitement, but unfortunately, the support behind it just hasn't really been there. We have seen some games included, like, for example, Battlefield 5 and Metro Exodus, but the majority of big games are waiting and seeing with the new tech and, obviously... I'm sure developers are very aware that obviously you need to have an RTX card to use it and they're not exactly cheap so they're probably waiting for that cost issue to be resolved as well before they throw a lot of money behind the development but with one pretty significant change to the Unreal Engine we could see ray tracing in a few more games as Unreal Engine now supports ray tracing and path tracing as well so we have low level and high level support for ray tracing being include included excuse me in the latest version of Unreal Engine 4 which basically means that this very very popular engine will now allow developers to implement this new technology relatively easily now that doesn't mean that every game ever is going to have it it's obviously a, a matter of budget skill time all that important stuff and obviously whether or not they want it there in the first place if you're making like a sort of lo-fi indie game you're obviously not going to have ray tracing in there that would be a bit mad but this is still really cool to see. It's obviously one of the most popular engines to, to this day and for good reason. So we could see the support for it from the developer side really increase, assuming, of course, that they find it worth their time, budget and, of course, man hours. Now, see, this means that a DirectX 12 card could obviously use ray tracing. It isn't just RTX specific, but obviously when you speak of ray tracing, you are thinking of NVIDIA ray tracing. And even if you don't need an RTX card specifically, you do need a high-powered card. So, yeah, you need RTX card to use, well, NVIDIA's ray tracing, but for DirectX 12, obviously, just a good card will, would be fine. But it's obviously still going to be quite demanding in the old performance. So we'll have to see exactly what the uptake is. But I think we'll definitely see an increase. So we're going to finish our proceedings today with, well, a bit of a sour note, unfortunately, regarding Microsoft. So what we actually have here is some very interesting comments from a Microsoft engineer, Matt Miller, who was speaking at an Israel security conference. And he basically said that more than 70% of Microsoft's patches are for memory safety bugs. And you might wonder, OK, why on earth is that percentage so high? And that is primarily due to the fact that Windows has been written mostly in C and C++ to things that he called quote-unquote memory unsafe programming languages excuse me, that does allow a developer fine-grained control of memory addresses where code can be executed. So that sounds great but one slip up from the developer in the memory management code can lead to a bunch of memory safety areas that someone who knows what they're doing can exploit such as remote code execution or elevation, words are hard, of privilege flaws. And 
as you might expect, due to this, well, memory safety errors are the biggest attack for hackers, and obviously they are very much aware of this and will be capitalising on it, which obviously why Microsoft spends so much of their time patching out memory safety bugs. But obviously the work doesn't just stop. Hackers find new loopholes and new things to exploit and all that sort of stuff, and obviously as more features are added, there's probably new holes opened up as well. So yeah, the, the work of, of, a, of a patcher is never finished basically, and this number will probably continue just to increase and just be a, a thorn in Microsoft's backside pretty much till the end of time. So that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. As always, your support is highly appreciated, and I'll see you next time.